Hi, thanks everybody for coming to the Art of Science Education, our panel discussion tonight on art as a pedagogical tool in uh, science education. You're here at Apex Art. I'm the programs manager here, Larissa Reinhardt, and we are surrounded by The Hidden Passengers, uh, a visual art exhibition curated by Avi Lubin. We hope you come back and check out the exhibition soon. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 6. Um, we'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you to silence your cell phones. Um, just a quick note of introduction of your panelists and then we'll turn it over to them to give a larger introduction. Ben Lilly is the director and co-founder of The Story Collider, which is a wonderful storytelling series. Hilary Livingston was uh, a lead artist on the redesign of the Natural History Museum uh, Hall of North American Mammals. David Wells is the manager of creative making and learning at the New York Hall of Science. And Joanna Ebenstein is a founder and director of the uh, Morbid Anatomy Library. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to your moderator, Ben Lilly. Thank you so much. Hi. Let's see. There we go. Um, hi. So uh, this, is, this is really exciting. Um, we, there's a lot of talk these days about uh, these days uh, about art and science and the way they inter intersect. And so um, I'm really excited to hear about that and how it changes when we add in the education aspect, which doesn't get talked about all that much and makes it uh, quite a wild ride when you try, try and put them together. Um, so uh, we've been asked to, to give a short background on all of us. And um, I'm someone who's sat in between these sorts of worlds for a lot of my life. Um, when I was in high school, I was known as the English guy. I was clearly going to go become a playwright. Mm -hmm. So naturally, I became a theoretical physicist, and um, which you know is a strange career to embark on. Um, and then from that, uh, realized I didn't actually want to do theoretical physics. I wanted to talk to people about theoretical physics, um, and so I started a, a stage event where I get to get up and have people tell stories about science in their life. Um, and it's an interesting project. We have people at the Story Collider get up and tell some true personal story. It's like the moth, if you've heard of them, only every story also involves science. And that brings us into this, this really weird space where we're using a lot of the, the concepts of uh, the arts. We're using narrative, in our case in particular, trying to make sure these things are compelling narratives, that they have this broader human point, and all the things you worry about while you do that. And at the same time, worrying about, OK, what kind of science are we getting across? Is the science actually correct? And all of those fun things. And, and that tension um, is something I've become very fascinated by. How do you have this kind of collaboration to produce a good uh, art science type thing that is true to both the, uh, the values of the arts and of the science? And what I found in looking at these projects is that this is an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, and uh, a, a fun challenge uh, to attempt to, to try and build a real collaboration <coughs> where you're drawing from both sides. So I love that uh, Apex Art is doing things like this. I love it when everyone tries um, and makes forays into this, and there's a whole lot going on, and that's very exciting. Now, it's a little interesting that I've been asked to chair a panel on science education. Um, I don't think Larissa knew this when they invited me, but when we start a Story Collider show, we get up on stage, she just looked up. Um, when we, we get up on stage and we say, hi, you're gonna hear five true stories about science, um, but these are not lectures, you will not learn anything. If you find yourself accidentally learning something, there's a handy bar that you can take advantage of. You know, and this is, this is part of it. And, and, and of course, we're not, um, we're not silly enough to think people aren't learning while they hear people tell their stories. Um, but there is a, a, a very different approach when people think that they're coming to learn something versus when they think they're coming to experience a story or coming to experience art. And you know, we, we have our own way of navigating that tension. But again, this is what I'm really interested in talking to this panel about, which is um, when you put art and science together, you have this interesting tension in the values of those two. If you try and put art and education together, you also have tensions there. Um, much of modern art really dislikes the idea of being uh, didactic for, for good reasons. But, so if you're trying to make good art that is also educational, how do you do that? So these are all the sorts of fun things that we're going to talk about here uh, today. Um, but having given that sort of framing of, of what, we're, what we're here for, um, let me turn it over to the panel who are going to one by one 
introduce themselves and what they do. So we will start with uh, Hillary Livingston, who worked at the Museum of Natural History. Sure, thank you, thanks for having me. Um, hello everyone, as you know, my name is Hillary Livingston and I'm delighted to share with you for the first time ever my experience on the other side of the glass as we restored several of the dioramas at the American Museum of Natural History. So you might be familiar with this image because it is one of the iconic dioramas of the museum. Now, the habitat dioramas are among the greatest treasures of New York and American culture and are superb examples of the fusion of art and science. They exist to educate us about nature and science and also to engender feelings of wonder about the natural world and, you know, they succeed brilliantly, in my opinion. They reverberate the vision, passion, and expertise of their creators of long ago who pioneered and perfected the art and technology of diorama making. Now, what I find fascinating about them is that they were created at a time before television, before internet, um, before wildlife photography indeed. Um, and this was a time when the average person could not travel to visit wild places far from home. Um, also, just to bring in the, the idea of technology, uh, incorporating 2D and 3D images was actually like the first form of virtual reality, and that's, that brought about their popularity. Um, sadly, um, some of these carefully chosen and actual locations no longer exist in pristine condition, except in these scenes behind glass. Other sites have been preserved and the wildlife protected thanks in part to the creators of the dioramas. They are timeless and unchanging scenes and have been and continue to be powerful advocates for conservation and grow even more poignant and valuable as we face such issues as climate change and the threat to life on Earth. Um, so I'd like to just quickly go through some of these images because I know we have a lot of other talking points to hit tonight on the matter of art and science. Um, but I'd like to introduce you to a saying used by one of the greatest AMNH diorama artists, James Perry Wilson. Um, and that phrase is ars celare artem, which means art to conceal art. Mm -hmm. This is a philosophy behind the, curate, the creation of diorama scenery. And what I love about this is that it's even referenced by some of my favorite uh, Japanese minimalist artworks, which look nothing like this scene but also project an image that looks as though no human hand had any interaction with it at all. Um, so if we can see the next scene. Um, can you tell which blades of grass are real and which ones are added? Please don't answer that. Mm -hmm. This is a point of anxiety for me <laughs> because I was a foreground artist, so I, it was my job to make the grass. Uh, and in the next scene, um, the next slide. Um, this is a snowy scene in the Adirondack Mountains um, of some white-tailed deer. Now, originally the snow was actually sand laid over a plaster substrate. And um, my job is very surreal. As you can see, I'm vacuuming sand that is snow off of a mountain, but I'm indoors. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it very strange. But you can see that we developed a new way to create Oh yeah, you could go to the next. You, we found a way to develop an even more realistic looking snow um, that would look much better than the sand. And the next slide there, this is the finished scene which looks much better in person. So, um, so you could go to the next one too. Um, going into the dioramas for restoration is not easy. In fact, a majority of the work was uh, moving our studio around inside the galleries and also building vestibules and platforms that would allow us inside without damaging the foreground materials. So in this case, those white boxes that you see are covering taxidermied birds on the ground to protect them from falling debris. It kind of, to me, looks like a scene of something strange you might see at the modern or something like that, but um, could go to the next 
next slide. So like I said, my job felt very surreal at times because the UV light bulbs had faded the leaves on this blooming dogwood tree. And my task was to mix a perfect shade of green and wake up the springtime color once again. And also um, on the next picture, um, I was a, a key developer in a new type of taxidermy bird conservation. Um, so to recolor the feathers was a difficult task because if you use acrylic paint, it would have caused the barbs of the feathers to stick together. And um, there's a rule about taxidermy restoration, which is no water. Uh, you don't want to see what happens. The skin warps, <laughs> it smells bad, we just won't even go there. Um, so that means that our choices were limited. Um, and so because the air does not move inside of the diorama, um, I found and the conservation department tested and proved that a simple application of dry pigment, like in the uh, photo you see in the upper right hand corner, would just simply sit on the surface of the barb and allow the scarlet tanager its fiery flanks once again. And the next, the next scene is just the, the finished product. Um, the scene restored from a drab and seasonally confused day to a clear bright May morning in Oyster Bay, which is actually the place where Theodore Roosevelt is laid to rest. He's our conservation president. The museum is actually the state memorial to his um, life and work. Um, also, I just encourage you to look into the before and after photos, which are available in plenty on the AMNH website. And if you go to the Hall of North American Mammals, there's an app that you can download on your phone and see, the, um, see everything right together um, before your eyes. And there are some news stories about it as well. So, yeah, thank you. All right. So now going out to Queens, we have uh, David Wells, who's at the New York Hall of Science. I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to stand up. I get a little nervous when I'm sitting down too long. Um, OK, yes, I'm David Wells. I work at the New York Hall of Science. I just want to take a general consensus here. Who here is or considers themselves an artist? Who here considers themselves a scientist? <laughs> okay, so we have one scientist. I'm hoping to sway you into thinking that maybe you might be one or the other, depending on uh, your perspective. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you a general overview of what we do. I run the Maker Space at the New York Hall of Science. Has anyone here heard of the Maker Movement? Been to the Maker Fair? Okay, awesome. So I won't go too far into that because you already know. But it's basically a movement that is the DIY movement, except it's giving it a bit of a funneled focus. So for instance, everyone that was a you know, musician in the DIY movement now has a platform to talk to everybody that is a robot designer, an urban gardener, and whatever else. The only credential you need to be a maker is to make something. Um, who here has made something before? <laughs> I think everybody, you're cold, I'm assuming your hand should be up, okay. Does Ikea count? What's that? Does Ikea count? Oh, 100%, 100%. <laughs> okay. So, the maker space, 1,200 square foot space in the museum. We try to change, shift, make things interesting for the visitors, creating experiences for them. Um, one of the frameworks as far as the education perspective that we have, um, I've built, um, is I call exploration learning. It starts out with deconstruction. Um, deconstruction is something that uh, I find essential to understanding the makeup of certain objects. For instance, if you look up here, there are kids, um, this is the experimental sound studio um, workshop that we have. I use musical instruments as an entry point to how sound works, um, the science behind sound. Kids deconstruct musical instruments. They lay all the pieces out on the ground uh, or on the table, wherever they are, and they make lists of the materials. We really focus a lot on materials and how materials interact, connect, and um, the role of each material within that instrument or whatever content area we're focusing on. So, for instance, plastic in the drum might be the reverberation, steel might be the structural aspect of the tuning pegs, but then if you look at something like a cowbell, the metal is the you know, reverberation chamber, the actual thing that 
that vibrates and the structural. So trying to expand the concept of materials literacy and understanding the multiple uh, uses for any material. Um, then we go to the discovery stage. Uh, we use contact microphones um, in this workshop to explore the area. Contact microphones uh, simply are microphones that pick up sound through objects as opposed to through the air. So the vibrations go through objects. I have one right here if anybody would like to experiment at some point afterwards. Um, and then we go into the designing and making. So the designing and making is we take all the information about the materials we know and put it together to create something. Next. And displaying is one of the sharing out our work is one of the really integral parts. We do um, aspects of reflection throughout our process, thinking about what we did, what worked, what didn't work, discussing you know, different ways to make things work. Then we show off our work. Um, we invite our family, our friends to come in, and then we articulate our process, how we made this, starting from one step going all the way through. Um, we really, really focus on tool use. Um, and I'm talking anything that helps you to do something, basically. And that's not the official definition of a tool, but I'm going to you know, say it now. Um, I mean, we use tape as a tool. We use you know, woodworking tools. We use digital tools. We um, have soldering electronics classes. We do all kinds of um, mixing and matching of aesthetics and creativity and thoughts um, coalescing into this, I guess, empowering experience of making something. And this is a video, oh no, sorry. This is, would be one of the examples of an instrument that we had made, um, or not we, but he had made. So after they've dissected instruments and understand the materiality of them and the tools they need to put together, they get very creative on how they piece these um, you know, instruments together. This is part stringed instrument, part horned instrument, and he put in some electronics there. You see the knobs and it's plugged in. There's a contact microphone inside his box so he can manipulate the sound and uh, he gets these really crazy uh, tunes. So this next slide is kind of what it looks like in the space. So that's pretty much it. Some people might think that's absolute chaos, but it's really controlled chaos that creates a platform for kids to be very creative and really pursue their own interests. Um, I would just like to close with a quote. I was just reading this the other day, and I thought it was very appropriate about what we try to do at the New York Hall of Science. We are going to develop an environment in which uh, new genera uh, which a new generation is so protected from the lovingly administered nonsense of grown-ups that it can develop naturally just in time to save humanity from self-annihilation. <laughs> Well, that was a perfect segue, uh, <laughs> self-destruction, because our next <laughs> panelist is from the Museum of Morbid Anatomy, which is what the whole world will look like in a few decades. Um, this is uh, Joanna Ebenstein from the Museum of Morbid Anatomy. Yeah, hi. Uh, first off, I want to apologize for not putting together a pretty presentation like everyone else did, because I'm putting together a museum right now, and it's taking a lot of time. <laughs> um, so I had no time to do that, but I was really excited to be part of the panel anyway. But um, so since 2007, I've been running a, a project called Morbid Anatomy. It started as a blog. It then expanded to be open to the public research library, my own collection of oddities and books, ephemera, art. Then it expanded to a lecture series that's now an international lecture series and now it's become this museum. And what we do with all of these things is survey, our, our tagline is we survey the interstices of art and medicine, death and culture. So my interest is where art and medicine intersect. Um, medicine, of course, being part of science. And um, there was something else I wanted to say about, oh, I'm also an Apex Art uh, outbound resident from a long time ago. I went to Korea, was it three years ago now? Uh, so this is part of what brought me here. And um, 
The other thing I want to say is what we try to do through Morbid Anatomy, through the blog, through the lectures, through everything, is create a kind of bridge between academia, academia and the popular audience. So we have lectures about three times a week. We have workshops and things like taxidermy, wet specimen preparation, um, carbon dust medical illustration, all sorts of kind of arcane arts that are usually taught by apprenticeships we have offered at our, at our space. And we have usually standing room only lectures on topics like anatomical wax works in European collections or the history of Halloween or all sorts of other things. So um, we're kind of trying to create adult, an adult education center that we don't really call that, but it, it kind of acts in that way. Well, thank you. Um, all right, so we're, we're gonna talk for a while and then at some point I'll throw it to, to questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna pick up on this, this last point that you had here, which is you know, sort of looking at an adult education lecture series. Um, and I, I guess my question, I'm trying to figure out a way to phrase this that isn't, what is education? Um, because that's a fun, easy question to answer. <laughs> but um, but you know, how, how do you think about learning? And this is for all of you in the context, because you're all approaching this very differently. And I think just to, to, to throw in a little educational mo moment here, um, it's interesting to me that, that everyone who is picked to be here is from a museum, because um, it was about 20-ish years ago. There's a real push from the museum world away from something called the public understanding of science, which is this model where you get up and you lecture and you teach people stuff, um, to something called public engagement with science, which what David does is, is become the epitome of that. Um, and it, it's intriguing to me that, that museums, which were at some level, one of the stuffier places, at least in popular culture, have, have become this, this fertile ground for ways of education that are not um, you know, your straight up lecture. So I'm interested in how you all think about what education is in, in the context of the art or, or science that, that you do. I like to think about um, ideas of rational amusement. That's my inspiration for, for education. The idea, I got really intrigued when I was reading about the history of natural history and the early sciences when people would gather around the microscope at night for fun because they, they'd go to the, the, uh, sea, the, the sea and they'd collect seashells and they'd collect coral and they'd collect seaweed and make these designs at home. This idea of kind of the parlor natural history really intrigued me. The idea of 18th century notions of learning for the sake of amusement and fun. And that's how I think about education. To me, we started doing a lecture series because to me, my idea of fun is to go out and hear something that's interesting with pictures and then have wine with friends. And it never occurred to me anyone else would be interested in it. But when we started the space, it turned out they were. So to me, that's how I think about education. It's not about professional advancement. It's not about anything outside the pleasure of having your brain stimulated and getting to learn new things. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's a big push to do a lot of different different lecture type series now. But it, it's interesting that this ties into what David does. And you know, the most excited I've ever seen any human being in my life is when I got to bring a microscope into a fourth grade classroom, and this one boy wanted to look at a scab under the microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably excited, right? And so I mean, this is this is part of your thing. Is it, you know, you're not trying to teach kids. You said you're trying to protect kids basically yeah. from adults. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I see actually just I just don't know. We do have one uh, program we're going to get in this week. Uh, no, um, next weekend, where you you create this, you laser cut a piece that fits on your phone, and it has a, a lens from a, a laser pointer. And this, basically, you can, I mean, you go in with your cell phone, you take pictures of really, not quite microscope volume, but maybe six times. Um, and so you can really investigate it. But, on to, yeah, on to like education and learning. Um, I find that we're in a really amazing time right now where um, all worlds are colliding and people don't really know how to interpret them. As I was saying, one of you know, my, uh, you know, the crux of my job is to create an environment where kids are free to learn on their own, kind of in their own process, from their own interests, um, which is something that I, um, I, when I'm learning, that's how I excel, um, the autonomy that's provided and the trust that I can actually myself and I think it'll longer or it might not be right the first time but or it might not ever be right but I'll, I'll, I'll keep chugging along and that's the type of environment we want. The mistakes kids make is um, really at um, the heart of their project and we don't uh, curb or change the fact that they're going to make mistakes. What we do is it's important to um, how you react to those mistakes and create an environment that's okay to admit your mistakes and then like discuss like well how can I make this mistake work or how can I you know, it's about, it's not about right and wrong, it's about what works when it doesn't. Um, and 
and then being broad enough to think in an expansive way, where I find um, the old way was uh, specialization, and right now we're, we're embarking on comprehensive generalization, basically, learning as much as you can to be able to do that much as you can in your life. Oh, sure. Um, I just, tonight I'm representing American Museum of Natural History, so I think it's important to note that um, right before the museum opened, the only the only place where people could go for something similar to see the cabinets of curiosities, which were these collections of odds and ends from around the world, was actually a P.T. Barnum Museum in 1868, which burned down. <laughs> and then the next year, A.M.H. Uh, became uh, like the new place where people went for that type of thing, and was then focused on education, where P.T. Barnum obviously was in no way education. Wait, so, so I think there might so be like it a burned down or it burned down. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. But but the reason why I bring it up is because I feel like, you know, when we're talking about, you know, stories, like the story of humanity, you know, we can look back on these on these times like at that at that point and say, okay, well it was time for a change and you know, we we might very well be a, a similar Get more advanced point, uh, just like that. But hopefully, nothing burns down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it is interesting. I mean, like you say, when, when the museum was first built, it was this huge revolutionary thing, you know. And it's only through familiarity that you think of it as this old, stodgy place. Um, but but you know that again, it, we constantly needing to change and update what we do and how we do it. Um, so actually, let me ask you. You were telling me this beforehand. Um, one of the, the interesting things going on in the museum right now is that the, I'm so sorry, I forget the name of the people, the preparators? Yeah. Preparators. Preparators. Um, you know, there's a very specialized artist who, who prepares um, the, which hilarious one, prepare these uh, the specimens. And, and what you're telling me is that this is, in a sense, going away because people have access to all of, all of these images in ways that are not through these diagrams. Actually, um, I, I've never prepared specimen. Taxidermy is something that I don't, I, I'm not particularly interested in it just as an artist. Um, I know that it's something that is not being, like, I can speak to this if you yeah. like. Actually, there's like a women's movement in taxidermy, which is really fascinating. All of this stuff is a women's movement. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, in terms of like the traditional art making at the museum, it is something that, um, was like a, it was a tradition that was handed down from one artist to another, and just because of the way that um, technology has rapidly advanced, you know, we don't have to send artists to another country to take molds of leaves anymore because there's a catalog for that. And you can just order them. So it is, yeah, it's a tradition that is uh, probably made, I would say, maybe 20 years yeah. at that one institution. And t tell me about this, this resurgence of taxidermy. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a real surprise to us, too. So we've been running this event space for the past five years, and I met a woman who had taught herself the art of anthropomorphic taxidermy, which is going to be no... The waste coats? The waste coats and stuff? Yeah, like yeah. squirrels and tallies brushing their teeth. I should have run images. <laughs> There's a Victorian artist named Walter Potter, who is the best known of these makers. I actually co-authored a book about him, so it's, it's all fresh in my head. And he did, um, like, kitten tea parties, Quirky matches, this is true. Uh, kitten uh, weddings, which is the only one that has clothes. Um, the rats uh, gambling den, and the, the which is having like being interrupted by police, and they're all getting into trouble. And then the squirrels like like kind of hang out, flush hang out. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. The the thing is, they're actually very beautiful, and they transcend the kitsch that it sounds like. But I've known just prove that with. Um, but I met this woman who had taught herself this art because she was so obsessed with Walter Potter, and I said, oh, you should come teach a class for us. And she said, oh, I will. And I thought, okay, maybe 12 people will sign up, and that will be that. It became a phenomenon. This was about five years ago. We couldn't, we had a 600-person wait list at one point. I'm not joking. It was like a full-time job to manage this class. It happened once a week, and it had a cult following, and it was 90% women, definitely 90% women. And now, to this day, our, our greatest offering, we have text learning classes almost every weekend, and they're sold out every weekend. And part of, some of these people are artists, some of them are curious about, I think, investigating an animal and seeing if they can handle it. Um, 
All I can tell you is it's alive and well. And probably pretty gross. No, it's actually not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, you know, I don't know if you talk about that later. It's very gross. Where do you get your dead uh, They're all ethically sourced. Um, <laughs> this, this is true. It's very important. Stuff. They're all, actually, yeah. the other thing to know about taxidermists, at least in my experience, is they're all animal activists, and most of them are vegetarians. They're people who love animals. Um, they're not hunters. They they deal with rope kill a lot. Um, also, feeder mice, which are killed for um, snakes. After a certain point, they just throw those away. So my um, teachers will just go pick, go pick them up when they're ready to be discarded. Well, it's interesting. I, just yesterday, someone was showing me this book from uh, about 1980, and it's called uh, Cats, 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 Cats. <laughs> And it, it's, it's exactly what you expect it to be. It's a book full of cat photos. And it's like someone had printed out the internet in the 1980s and anticipated it. But, but here we talk about, about Potter. I mean, the point is, is you know, we, we like to think of like cat photos as this weird incarnation of the internet. It's not. This is yet another of a recurring expression. Um, OK, so let, let me ask the, the, the sort of the flip side of the, the first question, which is, all right, so how this, we're here in an art gallery. We're talking about the art of science. Um, education. To talk to me about how art fits into um, what you're doing. And I'm going to ask David in particular, since that's the, the least clear, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, and I should say, for, for those who didn't read the bio, you are yourself an artist. Yeah, yeah like, I, I come from an artist background. I uh, spent many years trying to forge my way as an artist to no avail, really. Um, or at least no financial avail. Um, and I... Uh, find that it was really about my process. And when you take down like the creative process, the artistic process, whatever you want to call it, the design process, um, I started noticing through my education experience that um, all of a sudden all these processes popped up, the engineering process, the scientific process, the, all these processes. And you look at them, and you know, aside from specific articulation, that they're exactly the same thing. You start somewhere, you have some sort of question or challenge, you experiment, um, and then you iterate. Um, and I realized that, okay, being an artist didn't necessarily restrict me to actually the vast you know, nature of being an artist. I could be, I could make anything I want, you know, I could do anything I want. So it's like understanding the materials, and it's somewhat arguable that maybe an artist might be a, um, uh, what's material science? Yeah, like, you know, material science. When I uh, was, more heavily into creating artwork, you know, I, I didn't have money to necessarily buy whatever, you know, whimsical you know, material came to my mind, so I had to figure it out. How is this material going to work for me? How am I going to make this material work for me? Um, or I need to go find a material that can work for me. So um, I think that investigation and that discovery is really the baseline for science, or the impetus behind why people seek out, you know, learning science. And guided by the content, they end up focusing on different areas, but really you're doing the exact same thing. If you're going through art, you're going through engineering, you're going through, it's, it's, it's about solving a problem, whether that's an internal problem, external problem, societal problem, global problem, outside of the globe, whatever. Yeah, it, it's, it's really the same thing. I think the more people realize that and come together with that idea that it's, it breaks down the, with an education, the barriers of discipline. It's like, I'm not necessarily an engineer, I'm not this, um, I'm a learner. Yeah, um, yeah, I totally speak to that. I mean, in terms of when art comes into the picture, it's completely at the end. Um, for instance, when when I was working on the grass alone, there was no way. I mean, my boss said to me, "Make grass from nothing." We were not going to order it from a catalog because we were doing the traditional. You know, we've been commissioned to do this the way it's always been done. So I had to engineer a machine that would allow me to make blades of grass. There was no, and, and anyone I talked to who had been there years before me, was, they said, I don't know, test some things out. <laughs> so I did research, you know, paper, um, plastics, fabrics, glues, wire, dowels, all of these, you know, materials that you'd see in any store. And, you know, there are a couple of rules of conservation. Um, one is that you have you can't you can't take anything out. You have to add 
something on top of it, it has to be reversible, like it, you have to be able to remove it like it never happened. And it also had to be archival, which means it uh, won't move or change color or anything for 200 years. That was the number that they went with. So, you know, there was like some parameters, materials that they could work with. But they have like some machine that does like wind <laughs> testing or something like that. It it's it's a year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
um, and what is art, you know, what art is about. It might be, you know, art might be a little more internal sometimes, arguably not, but then science is more external. So thinking about the processes and how they, you know, basically intersect is, is really, it's, it's a revolution. I think we're part of a zeitgeist. You know, I think there's a reason that we're here talking about this tonight because it's not just us who are thinking about these things and caring about these things. I don't think it's necessarily trickled down to mainstream society completely yet, but I do think, you know, we're dealing with really big problems now that specialization isn't really going to help. Global warming is all about how things are interconnected. Like, there's no way we can solve. Like, I, I feel like these ideas we've had about, well, we'll just focus on this, we'll learn everything about this, and learn everything about this. Are, it, it's great to know that, but it's we have very big problems that are really about how things relate to one another, which is an entirely different way of thinking about things. That's how we used to think about things until the 1850 probably. So I think I think things are going to have to go in this direction. I think there still are challenges, but to surmount the challenges we have, we have to go back in that direction. And that's why people are driven that way. That's my feeling. Okay, so I, I'm going to keep up. I'm finding myself in a weird position. Usually when I'm on panels and at conferences, I am the weird arts guy and a bunch of scientists. And now I'm finding that I'm, I'm the scientist in a room full of artists. So let's go with that. Um, but just, just to really push on this, um, what would you do, you know, one, one of the things that scientists care deeply about and one of the, the things that I hear complained about in, in the arts is the notion of accuracy and, and correctness, if you will. So, you know, what do you do if you have a kid come in, um, you, you know, you're focused on there not being wrongness. What do you do if you have a kid come in and he wants to do a project about how creationism is right or how the earth isn't, climate change isn't happening? I don't know if that would actually happen in your environment, but, you know, what, what are you doing something like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it has never happened in my, yeah. in, in my environment, but um, my general approach to any sort of project or anything that kids are working on is, again, I want to come from what their interests are, and nine times out of ten, it's not about me, well actually, ten times out of ten, it's not about me telling them any answers to questions. I always say I'm not in the business of answering questions, I'm in the business of actually creating them. So like, um, when they come with those kind of questions, I offer them a conversation. I think, you know, well what exactly do you want to achieve by this? How would you achieve that? And by letting them think about it and giving them the platform to think about that is something that they don't really get. I mean, I don't ever remember getting as a child. It was more, go here, do this, um, go to bed. And that's pretty much it. You know, or eat that, and then go to bed. <laughs> My parents did see But like, you know, it's just, you never get that, the, that feeling of empowerment as a child. So if somebody were to ask me, even though I would say I'm not necessarily a believer in you know, like creationism, obviously, but I would let them explore that on their own. I wouldn't give them an answer to that, which you know I do know the answer. <laughs> it's more about letting them discover it. And when they make that mistake or when they have that problem, they'll realize one way or another. And it's like really, is it working? Why isn't it working? Figure it out. I don't know if that answers your question. Your previous question kind of inspired me a little bit just thinking about the idea of convergence. And younger generations of people are really just completely immersed in technology and in terms of like scientific accuracy, you know, maybe it's true that a lot of people take that for granted, like how many calculations a phone has to make, um, just to make your life very easy. Um, but uh, I feel like um, the idea that something needs is like either correct or not correct is such a cold and like way to veil the entire idea of science just I mean just to generalize you know that really pushes people away from uh, being curious about it I mean I think everyone knows who Albert Einstein is but maybe not everyone knows about his thought experiments which are completely accessible and you know he there's tons of like Bartlett's quotes about, you know, imagination, and, you know, there are so many, um, so many inventions that have made our lives 
so convenient and wonderful that came about through science fiction and you know through people imagining how our life could be better even though you know the how wasn't necessarily there and then that's where science comes in where there's a practice to it well does it work or does it not work and that's where correctness comes in if your invention works then it's correct if it doesn't work then you know i guess keep trying but but yeah i feel like those people from back in the old days just maybe had some other motive for you know this this happens in academia too where there's like this jargon that just blocks people from understanding it it's totally unnecessary in my opinion yeah, and, and actually, just on the you know the concept of working and not working, which is really something that we try to emphasize um, in our space. But it's like I always say, um, just because it doesn't work now, it doesn't mean it won't work in a month or a year or ten years from now. So like, don't ever trash the idea. Like, keep it there in case these things change all the time. You know, like so it's a matter of right now it's not working, but don't think that it's useless because every idea I think, has value at some point. So um, I, again, I'm in a weird position here where I feel like I'm, I want to be devil's advocate. I agree with, with all of you, but I just want to push on this. So, so one thing that um, you know, if you, if you walk into the sciences, you say, why, why is this successful? You know, part of it is curiosity, and, and every scientist will tell you curiosity is huge. This is a huge part of it. But also, part of it is the fact that you don't have to repeat all the experiments that people have done before. Right? I can make an advance in my field. Because I don't have to rediscover the structure of DNA, I can do my genetics experiments. So where does that fit into this picture of let's explore and make our own mistakes? Well, I mean, sorry, um, I mean, one uh, one aspect of that, as I said, I'm I'm providing an entry point. So by no means, uh, you know, as I said, I know if you know yet in in the genetics, there's got to be some sort of uh, Thing that you, you know, things you need to figure out and learn, you know, and learn from what has happened in the past. But I find, I mean, one of the things that I say to my kids all the time, or families, or anyone in the you know, space, is like, okay, this is kind of, you know, what we're going to be you know, talking about is what we're doing, and if you ever feel the point, like, prove me wrong. Like, that's that's one of my kind of statements. Like, at any point, just prove me wrong, and I will, and, like, openly discuss this with you. Why? You know, so like setting up that platform is really that entry point where. I'm hoping that when they leave me or you know, you know go on to do whatever they do, they have that confidence, that creative confidence to interpret for themselves. You know, like and people say, like, what's the biggest challenge of you know, you know, the job search today? Or what's the biggest challenge of a kid in college? Or what is like the biggest challenge is thinking for yourself because there is so much back knowledge that is thrusted in, like into your brain, and you don't really have a choice. You just you have to accept it because that's right. You know, and I think offering that at certain points couldn't necessarily or wouldn't necessarily be the best, you know, action. But in the position that I'm in, I'm, I'm I want them to have that confidence to say, wait a second, you know, why why do you say this? Oh, it's just the way it is. It's like I don't know. Let me try it first. You know. Cool. Okay. Again, this was a surreal experience for me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm never in the position of being the scientist. And I'm off next week to go teach a bunch of scientists how to communicate. So thank you for giving me all of you. Um, good um, communication. I'm going to throw it open to questions from the audience here. Um, yeah. So um, I love everything that you said. I'm, I'm an educator, I'm an amateur scientist, experimenter. Um, and I hear a lot, and the participants are make a movement as well. Um, but one of the things I'm hearing is kind of this concept of the everyday science and the idea that everybody can engage in the everyday scientists, being an everyday scientist. One of the things that I fear that when hearing that is that the way to make everyday science accessible is to make us fear math. So I'm curious about how do you push the rigor and the kind of the next degree of like the inquiry pushing towards scientific inquiry that is quantitative and also, or do you, right? It, 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 or is it a problem really that it isn't there? I mean, even though I don't, I don't work with this kind of thing directly, I would say that to me, if you're curious enough about something, you start that surmounting the obstacles of learning things like math can seem like such a big deal. Like when I started, I got into all this stuff with history of medicine because I love anatomical models, and I've been 
think I'd ever start trying to be French or learn about it. It's like being so obsessed that I want to know more and more. And you start to go down the rabbit hole. Before you know it, you're doing all these things. You're taking classes. You're traveling around. You're learning languages so you can do this stuff. So I think for me, at least, it, it's the curiosity and love of the thing that gives me the strength to surmount things like learning math. That would be my actually. And there's, a, there's a really a fun example of this is there's a um, there's a citizen science project called Galaxy Zoo where people are supposed to um, it's one of these ones where, where you're supposed to donate your time to help science and they show you pictures of galaxies and you're supposed to classify is this uh, ellipsoid spiral irregular okay it turns out humans are still way better at that than computers so so they have people donate their time to do this and there's some message boards that people can talk to each other. and what happened is at one point somebody had noticed a bunch of galaxies that were sort of smaller, spherical, and kind of green, and didn't look like anything that they were being told to look for. And they started posting on the boards, and at first it was this series of jokes, like, look at the green peas, and then a bunch of things, like, give peas a chance, and, and all the things like that. And, um, but as they kept going, they kept wondering what this thing was. And the, these, these citizen scientists who had no backgrounds in physics started learning about spectroscopy, they started teaching themselves about spectroscopy, and the end result of this was a publication in a scientific paper using full-blown spectrographic techniques, identifying what these objects were, and I wish I'd remembered, but I don't know. But they, they basically taught themselves all the spectroscopy they needed up to the level of the professionals, and then published this paper. And you know, I, to me, that's one of the great success stories of this. Um, you provide an entry point, and not everyone, but some people are going to go down, down that road. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the you know, really important things I say, for instance, with math, like, it's really, really important for application. Like, if, if you don't, not necessarily know enough, I mean, obviously, but like, if you try to impart knowledge or an experience, develop anything for any in a learning process, and they have no attachment to it in their life or what they're doing, it, it's going to fall to the wayside. It's like learning a language that's never been in the country. You know, like, you are never going to use it, so, like, why would you ever know that? But when you're put in a position um, to figure out what these possibilities available to you are, and you need to figure out this mathematics or this sort of you know, structural integrity that's going to make this thing work, you figure it out, and that's really at the you know at the root of what you know we do here is like that kind of like I, like we want to teach that I can mentality, like I can do this, you know, I, I like it's fine, and then you're not completely you know crippled by it not working, and realizing like hmm. Okay, now what's the you know, kind of inquiry based you know, process, reflection, whatever you want to call it? How do I get over this hump? Or maybe you know, do I redirect? You know, so it's like being able to handle that is, I think, really, really the strength of what at least I want to do in my space um, in general. Oh, and actually, sorry, can I just say one more thing then? Um, that's one um, struggle we have a lot in our space with using a lot of technology. Um, sorry, using a lot of digital technology, computer technology. Is that we have a you know what it's called an underserved population around our you know, museum, and a lot of the kids in my programs are from that community. And it's like, okay, do this you know 3D design here, and we're going to print it out in a you know, 3D printer. Yeah, this is fun, right? And then they go home, and it's like they don't have a 3D printer at home, they don't have a computer at home, they have no access to this. So like, what am I really in, you know what, I'm going to incorporate? It's like, see how the other half lives? Isn't this awesome? You know, I mean, so it's 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 a real struggle. It's like, how can I empower them to like take this home? So as part of our weekend program workshops, we have you know, the Make It At Home Challenge. They start their project here, and then it's like they make it at home, and then they send us pictures, or you know, they, you know, they tweet us, or they send us on their Instagram. And you know, thinking, like, oh, well, they have access to tweet, you know, tweets. But I don't know what the actual percentage is, but smartphones are almost in every single person's pocket in the city. So that's enough to have you know, like maintain their connection. So it's, it's, it's a really kind of slippery slope. Just like a one sentence thing. I wish somebody had told me in school that algebra is how to build a website. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was really interested to how you're all like in different museums, um, especially um, your new museum that you're building and uh, I guess that's my, my question is how how are you going about building in this New museum, like what kind of models are you looking to? But in particular, what I'm interested in is um, how do you incorporate art into that? Is that something that? 
if you start just to pay back money, how many museums like yours are there? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so for many part question, um, I can handle this. The Marlin Museum is, um, it's not going to show contemporary art, I can say that right off the bat. It's going to show um, material culture from private collections and ultimately from museum backstages. I want to show things that no one else is showing or talking about in a serious way. That's, that's our mission, kind of. So the kind of things no one takes seriously or that, that falls between the cracks is what we're saying. Falls between the cracks of the disciplines, art and science, for example, high and low culture, um, things that are, you know, much of what my investigation has been about in the past seven or eight years.